Hello and welcome everyone to EAC's first of our webinar series, Our Coastal Climate. This is a series of webinars that's dedicated to the issues our communities in coastal West Marin County are facing due to the climate crisis. So since 1971, EAC has remained engaged in the protection of West Marin's unique lands, waters, and biodiversity through advocacy, engagement, and education. It's one of the only local environmental advocacy nonprofits taking on multi-year and sometimes decade-long campaigns to address environmental threats. We provide an essential voice on behalf of, the West, of West Marin's priceless natural resources. We accomplish our work by bringing people, science, policy together to protect the places we love. Very often, our work is not accomplished overnight. The long-term support and generosity of our membership community is vital to our ongoing efforts to ensure environmental protection measures are in place and lasting, especially as our communities uh, mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis. The climate crisis presents an immediate need for action, addressing the environmental hazards associated with the impacts of the changing climate and building community resilience is at the forefront of our work. These are complicated issues and there is a need for additional public outreach and education for our communities as we collectively make decisions that have lasting impacts for our future generations. And so now I'm gonna to introduce to you EAC's conservation director, Ashley Eagle Gibbs. Ashley joined our team in 2016 and works primarily on our initiative focused on water and climate. She's a Marin County native and brings with her a strong background in environmental law, policy and advocacy. While at EAC, she has expanded our program capacity, started a legal internship program, and participated in the 2017 Sonoma Marin Coastal Regional Sediment Management Working Group. And she's also the representative for EAC on the Tomales Bay Watershed Council and part of an offshore oil opposition coalition called Protect the Pacific, um, and as well the representative for an Endangered Species Coalition and the Wetlands Restoration <laughs> Principles Coalition. She leads our Waters Advisory Committee and um, acts as the Vice Chair for the Marin State Parks Association. And in 2019, Ashley participated in Drawdown Marin Stakeholder Collaborative on Carbon Sequestration and presented on Blue Carbon Initiatives. So please join me uh, to welcome Ashley, who's going to speak a little bit about her work here. And you, I'm going to hand the controls to you, Ash, so you can share your screen. So thanks, Morgan, and it's great to see everyone here virtually, and I am honored to be speaking to all of you and alongside such esteemed colleagues. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Oops, sorry. Sorry, guys, thanks for bearing with me. I speak in front of public agencies a lot, but I don't do PowerPoints as often. So I am going to start things off with a poll to see how involved um, people have been in local and state climate planning efforts. So um, Morgan, if you can help me get that started. Um, so let's see, yeah, so go ahead and take the poll. And um, this poll is about whether you've participated in Marin's climate planning efforts or other climate planning efforts. We've got votes coming in, about 20% so far, so keep voting. Uh, about 60%, and if you're not sure um, on any of these, you can select the bottom option, which is not applicable, and that's okay. Thanks for humoring us on these polls, trying to keep it a little bit more engaging. All right, we're at about 80% response. It looks like everyone has voted. Um, yes, Leslie, I see your chat in there, commenting count, so you can put your, your yes on the Marin cap. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with you guys. So it looks like we've got um, quite a few people who have participated in different planning efforts, which is great. And I'm yeah. gonna stop sharing this, Ash, so it doesn't stay up on your screen. There we go. Okay, thanks. So at EAC, I work primarily on our water work, our land use planning work, and our climate work. Water is really one of our primary program areas, and the climate crisis touches all of our work. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about what inspired us to start this coastal climate webinar series. But first, before we get to that, where is West Marin? Um, we could see from the poll, a lot of you are from West Marin, so bear with us. Um, but I am going to go ahead and show a map um, just for those of you that might be from outside the area. So West Marin is the western side of Marin County, and it's located about an hour north of San Francisco. This map from Google shows most of the county, and then that red line at the top, that's the board, the northern border. So Petaluma, you can see, is in Sonoma County. Um, and so many refer to areas of West Marin as the backyard of Marin County and really the Greater Bay Area. And we're really lucky to have almost 57% of the county's land protected as parks, preserves, wildlife refuges, and open space. And most of these protected lands are found in West Marin. And then talking a little bit about our water resources, we have uh, in Marin County, we have a network of fresh and marine water systems that support globally significant and extraordinarily diverse onshore and offshore habitats. And in rural West Marin, there's miles of county, state, and federal trails and coastal public access points that span all the way from Dillon to Muir Beaches. And um, Dillon Beach, you can see at the, the northwest uh, top there. And then Muir Beach is uh, just a little bit south of where Stinson Beach is on this map. There's so many treasures to explore out in West Marin, like Bolinas Lagoon, which is that um, blue uh, piece of water right above Stinson Beach, Tamales Bay. You can see um, that's kind of where uh, Inverness and Marshall, Marshall border that. And then, or even the vast Pacific Ocean. And off of Marin Shores, one can experience the abundant biodiversity. We're lucky to have two sanctuaries right off the coast, the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries, as well as a large network of California's marine protected areas. Just talking a little bit about our coastal communities that a lot of you are um, part of. So West Marin supports a number of unincorporated coastal communities or small villages from the north to the south. So we mentioned um, Dillon Beach, Marshall, Point Reyes Station, Olima, Inverness, Stinson, Bolinas, and Muir Beaches. So we love our coastal communities. Um, talking a little bit about watersheds. So since our founding in 71, we've protected and sustained West Marin's vibrant watersheds. That includes Tamales Bay and Bolinas Lagoon, as I just pointed out. We accomplish our work by protecting, preserving, and enhancing the unique and vulnerable marine and freshwater resources and habitats of these water bodies, restoring and maintaining water quality and supporting policies and actions which employ precautionary principles to sustain the complex ecological functions of the watersheds. And another very important aspect of our work is our work around coastal adaptation planning or coastal resiliency. And that includes um, being part of the Coastal Communities Working Group organized by Marin County. I think we have some folks from Marin County on the Zoom today. And our 10 plus year involvement in updating Marin County's local coastal program, which is under the California Coastal Act. The county's local coastal program update is almost complete, except for the critical environmental hazards sections. And those are the ones that deal with sea level rise. The climate crisis presents an enormous challenge for our human and ecological communities. Morgan and I recognize that there was a need for EAC to expand public knowledge on the challenges by featuring information and resources on the dynamic landscape of the climate crisis um, with, by adding additional information um, for your viewing and, and just so we can be better prepared to plan and be resilient. So we are actively engaged, just a little bit about how do we do our work at EAC? Uh, which uh, Morgan touched on this, but we are actively engaged in coastal protection policy work and coastal resiliency planning efforts. We do this by submitting comments, by testifying, community engagement, and by participating in stakeholder groups, as I mentioned with the Coastal Communities Working Group. So with climate change, pollution, shifting political priorities, tourism, and the many other factors impacting our environment, we remain fastidious at EAC in reviewing and researching the issues that are the most important to our coastal communities. So our work is grounded in our guiding principles where we apply science, law, and policy to make ethical decisions around complex environmental issues in a dynamic environmental and political landscape. And I just wanted to thank you for all coming today and helping us launch our first webinar in this coastal climate series. And um, Morgan, I'm gonna go ahead and um, turn it back to you.
now have the honor to welcome Dr. Charles Lester. Dr. Lester is a director of ocean and coastal policy in the Marine Science Institute at UC Santa Barbara, where he researches, writes, and advises about sea level rise, coastal resilience, and other aspects of coastal law, uh, law policy and management. Charles previously worked for the state of California and the California Coastal Commission for 20 years, serving as the agency's fourth executive director from 2011 to 2016. Previously, he was an assistant professor of political science at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he taught environmental law and policy with a focus on public lands governance and coastal zone management. He received his PhD and JD Juris Doctorate from UC Berkeley and a BA in geochemistry from Columbia University. Charles is an expert in integrated coastal management and the California coastal law and policy. His extensive experience in California, including managing and directing hundreds of coastal planning and regulatory projects for the Coastal Commission. EAC had the honor of recognizing Dr. Lester in 2016 with our Peter Bear Steward of the Land and Sea Award for his work to uphold the California Coastal Act. We also wanna recognize him for his completion of California's first comprehensive land use guidance for addressing sea level rise and coastal protection on the outer coast. Today, we're pleased to welcome him with his presentation, presentation that discusses the challenges of the looming climate crisis and our coastal communities will face that examines a fundamental question on coastal resilience. How can communities reduce the growing coastal hazard risks of climate change while still protecting people's broader interest in the coast? including public beaches and diverse ecosystems that are so integral to California's economic, social, and cultural identity. So welcome, Dr. Lester. Great, thank you very much, Morgan and Ashley. It's really great to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? We can, and your screen is perfectly shared. Okay, um, well, it, it is great to be here for this um, series and uh, I'm gonna try to cover a lot of material in a short space of time and hopefully have time for questions after uh, we're all done speaking at you. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it and uh, give you my sense of what's going on here with this issue. Um, first of all, I think probably most of you given the answer to that first poll understand that in California, we've been uh, actively managing our coast for almost 50 years now. And I would summarize that effort in three things, rule of law, science, and democracy. And certainly groups like EAC have become an integral part of the success of California's coastal management because it relies on people being engaged and using the law and using science to move us forward under the, the policies that we put in place uh, back in the 70s. And that is probably, again, a lot of you know, was Proposition 20 in 1972. And we st uh, staked out some territory for ourselves. And we said the coastal zone is this distinct, valuable place. It belongs to all of us. And also that its permanent protection is critical, including for not just ourselves, but future generations. So we set a high bar for what we wanted to accomplish. In 1975, we completed a coastal plan and we asked ourselves this basic question, which is, shall the coast be abused, degraded, eroded, or shall it be used intelligently with its majesty and productivity protected for future generations? So we, again, we set a high bar for ourselves, but we ended up passing the Coastal Act in 1976 and it articulates a lot of strong but broad policies that protect all of these different kinds of resources we find along the coast and most of these, all of these really in Marin County as well. So, um, you know, quite a, a history of management in California and it's well recognized as a successful coastal management program. One of the most successful uh, nationally for sure, if not in the world. But this question of climate change really um, is bringing to, you know, forcing us to confront some basic questions about this legacy that we've had and asking, well, what is our legacy gonna be? And now that we're facing climate change, how is that gonna be reshaped potentially? This is uh, something called the Sunken Cathedral at the Ritz-Carlton in Half Moon Bay. It was the original foundation that was put in before that construction was stopped and the hotel moved further back from the edge. But I remember the first time I saw this, I was walking down the beach and I rounded the corner and I looked up and here was this thing sticking out of the bluff and I just, it reminded me of that scene in the 
original Planet of the Apes when Charlton Heston rounds the corner and sees the Statue of Liberty sticking out of the beach and he goes, oh my God, what have we done, right? So we're, we're doing things on our coast and we have to ask ourselves, well, what is that legacy gonna be in the future for our kids and their kids? And there's Charlton Heston looking up at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, but this question of sea level rise, um, the first thing we need to understand is not just that it's real, but that it's happening and it's not, and there's nothing we can do about that. So as the IPCC uh, recently summarized, it's, it's going to continue to rise and it'll be higher in our future in all cases, even if we join back into the Paris Agreement. So we've, we've loaded the system with a, a certain amount of sea level rise. There's a question about exactly how much, but we know it's going to be higher. So we need to confront it. We need to deal with it. And in California, we've been uh, bringing our science to bear again on this question. And we've got projections up and down the coast. And these are the ones based on um, uh, monitoring that's taking place in Point Reyes, actually. So just as two examples, um, projecting by 2150, anywhere from a low risk, uh, a likely outcome of a foot of sea level rise up to almost three feet of sea level rise in 2050 in an extreme version, depending on what happens. In 2100, three and a half feet of sea level rise and maybe up to 10 feet of sea level rise, depending on what happens again. And that's driven by uh, our modeling of what might happen with global ice melt. So uh, uncertainty in exactly how much it's gonna go up, but it is going up. So when we think about sea level rise on the coast, uh, it's not really complicated at one, in one sense. It's just about the water level, right? And the level of the water defines all of these things that we care about. It defines where the wetlands are or are not. It defines where beaches are or are not and how they're shaped. And it defines how we develop along the coast. So what is the water level and how is it going to change? And that's what we're, I mean, we need to be uh, concerned about. Well, the science is telling us that almost every day, it seems like the projections are getting higher. It's going to be worse. And the implications of this statewide, these are just some of the recent ones. Uh, two thirds of Southern California beaches may disappear by 2100. 83% of our tidal wetlands on the entire West Coast would be underwater by that same time. And about half of our habitat areas along the coast are vulnerable to the sea level rise. So significant impacts to all of those resources that we set out to protect uh, in the Coastal Act. And this is just one example of some of the um, projections and change in shoreline that we might see. This is from Capistrano, but you can see, depending on your assumptions about sea level rise over time, by 2100, which is this yellow line, the beat, there is no beach, right? You've got the highway and maybe a parking lot if it hasn't been destroyed by then. So we're, we stand to lose a lot from sea level rise. The bottom line is the coastal squeeze, what people call the coastal squeeze is real. And we're gonna have increasing conflicts between the use and protection of resources and forces of the sea. This is just one example from Malibu where they're trying to have a surf competition and there's barely enough room for all the people to be on that beach. And most, no doubt a lot of you have seen the information for Stinson Beach in Marin County in West Marin, which also shows the same kind of trends. This is just one example of what Stinson Beach might look like in 2100 in a hundred year storm if we assume a meter of sea level rise. It's basically almost entirely underwater. Uh, and we've done a lot, Marin County's done a lot of great work analyzing and projecting what some of the impacts are going to be in Marin County from sea level rise. This is an example of the beach loss that you could anticipate, depending again on what kind of sea level rise you have, but essentially uh, in certain high, high sea level rise scenarios, Stinson Beach is down to two feet wide. It's not really Stinson Beach any longer, it's Stinson. So how, how did we get there? Um, this is a shot of Pacifica in the mid 1940s and you can see that there's an undeveloped uh, beach with a back dune system, a little bit of development beginning here. Well, since that time, we decided that that was a developable location. And I believe this building here uh, is that building there. And so we identified this as, oh, a good place to put development. And that's what's there now. But you can see where the beach would want 
to be if it was left to its own devices. And so I used one of my sophisticated graphics programs to kind of estimate where that line is. And you can see that if that development wasn't there, we would still have a beach that looks something like this. You can see it on the other side too. So the basic problem we're confronting is that we've decided to develop in a lot of what I call, it's a technical term, a lot of dumb places. We've put development on sand spits, we've put it on the, at the mouth of rivers, we've put it in between the ocean and wetlands uh, up and down the coast. And so these are inherently hazardous, unstable places that we now need to figure out what to do about given sea level rise. The other thing that's apparent is that we've um, developed in a lot of places where the water used to be. And so this is a really a good example of that. Here's the footprint of San Francisco Bay in 1849. Here's the projection of sea level rise in 2100. And they're amazingly the same, right? The water is gonna be going back to where it used to be. And you can see that up and down the coast. This is Huntington Beach. That's the old uh, wetland system that used to be there. This is Humboldt Bay where we uh, diked and filled the wetlands and put Highway 101 in here. This is what the projected flooding is. It matches amazingly to what the uh, footprint of the bay used to be. This is San Santa Barbara. Uh, this flooding, projected flooding footprint actually maps pretty well to the lagoon system that used to be in downtown Santa Barbara. So we've kind of set ourselves up for a real challenge here by the way we decided to develop. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is that this challenge was essentially put in place before we even started regulating the coast. So a lot of our development and the patterns were set before uh, 1970. And this is an example from Santa Cruz where you see the coast was built out even before we adopted Proposition, Proposition 20. So we have been um, actively trying to take on this issue in California. And uh, this is some uh, work that I was pleased to participate in early on. We set, put in place grant programs to start funding local adaptation planning like Marin County has been doing. And you see a gradual increase in our investment in this work. When people think about what to do, um, this is sort of an <clears throat> understatement of the year from the IPCC that identifying the most appropriate way to respond to sea level rise is not straightforward and is politically and socially contested with a range of governance challenges, also called barriers. Uh, so we've got a big order here, a tall order to meet, but um, the responses have been categorized by the IPCC as we can do nothing, we can protect, we can accommodate, we can advance, uh, we can retreat, or we can do things with ecosystem adaptation. And I'm gonna walk through some of those examples in California. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is just talk briefly about advance because we don't talk about that really here. This is one of the classic examples of the Palm in Dubai where we've taken millions of uh, cubic yards of sand and made land right out in the ocean uh, to advance in response to the ocean. Now, I don't think that's really an option in California, although I did toy for a moment with doing something in Bolinas Lagoon, you know, but I didn't think the Coastal Commission would go for this. Maybe in the 1970s they would have, but I don't think advancing is really an option for our, our situation. Um, we do talk about the other three categories though, of a protection, accommodation, and retreat. And that's what is in the sea level rise guidance from the state back from 2015. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is the basic uh, hazard policy that we do have in place, which is essentially two ideas. One, uh, new development needs to minimize risk to property and not require the construction of seawalls or protection. And two, existing development, if it's the least environmentally damaging feasible alternative, can be protected with a seawall. So we did two things at the same time back in the 70s. And these are implemented typically through local government um, planning programs, the LCPs. So the challenge geologically is also uh, pretty tricky and there's a lot of uncertainty and we tend to think about erosion as an incremental process, but in fact, it often happens episodically in big, big chunks uh, every so often. And this is again, an example from Pacifica where in the short space of a couple of weeks, we lost up to 90 feet of land at this one location. Um, this one was particularly troubling because these couple of dogs here did not make it. 
uh, the you know the challenge of uh, figuring out when erosion is going to happen is is pretty difficult. In California, we've done a lot of good work with uh, requiring setbacks for new development. So here you can see the contrast between this Pismo Beach subdivision uh, that was approved by the Coastal Commission versus what we built before the Coastal Act. Required it to be set back, put public access in on the bluff top, etc. It's not a uh, again not complicated. It's let's move further away from the hazard. But it is challenging. And here's an example where that uh, example I just gave of the land falling away. This development was approved before the Coastal Act, right before it was built uh, in 1976. It was set back in theory to be safe for 75 years to 2047, based on the erosion science that we had at the time. Well, a seawall was constructed 40 years later. Uh, I was lucky enough to have to work on this one. Uh, a huge seawall put in place to protect the condominiums, which are now uh, down to about 30 feet in certain places. And since that time, that seawall has also failed uh, because of construction issues uh, resulting in this basic uh, construction mess on the beach. And so it raises you know, questions about how we, how we have been managing on this particular issue and whether we're doing ourselves any favors with public access and protecting beaches when we end up having beaches that look like this. This is a huge sand berm that was put in place to, con to protect the construction that was happening to fix the seawall, right? <laughs> you can see it here so they could do the work. <clears throat> the other thing that's happening in some places, and this is right next door in Pacifica, is we can't really stop the forces of nature in, in certain conditions. And so these apartment buildings have been demolished because we couldn't save them, even though we tried with this revetment here. And so we've seen cases of what might be called unplanned retreat. Nobody planned for these buildings to be removed, but they had to be removed. See, I need to speed up a little bit here. Under the law, because of um, you know the way it was set out to protect development that was already in place, it's really been hard for the Coastal Commission to not um, allow seawalls to go in. And so we've seen the expansion of seawalls in a lot of urban places up and down the coast, pretty a matter of fact. And you know, seawalls are problematic. This is a vision from Blade Runner 2049 where there's this huge seawall going across the center of LA, right? And this is not really science fiction because people are talking about these massive construction works in New York City. We've already seen them in, in the Netherlands. They're talking about it in the Gulf of Mexico a lot. So the tension on what well, we can just protect ourselves from the forces of the ocean. But seawalls have a lot of problems, right? They inevitably lead to the loss of our beaches. And so you build a seawall, if, if the ocean cannot continue to move back, you're gonna lose that area in front of it. And we see that up and down the coast. And we've been calculating that impact for decades now. And these are just a couple of examples here. You can see the beach in 72 was connected. You could walk along it. These houses have since armored themselves and you don't have a beach here, but you do have a beach where it hasn't yet been armored. It's not, again, not rocket science, it's physics. Here's another example uh, down south, narrower beach in front of the seawall. Uh, we, we have um, developed our regulatory programs to ask for mitigation of this impact. And one of the best examples is, are these condominiums in Monterey where we required a, over $5 million fee for the loss of this beach area over time. Uh, but that doesn't take care of the fact that this beach is going to disappear no matter what we do. And so already you can see it, this is that same location at King Tide last year where there essentially is no beach to speak of. The second, uh, moving from protection uh, or hard protection to soft protection, we've spent a lot of time with beach nourishment, which is another way of protection, but using sand and building beaches to do that. And we do have a lot of activity in California, most of it in Southern California. In fact, building up about 50 miles of beach over time at about $340 million, uh, but that's nothing compared to the over two and a half billion dollar costs that we've put into Florida so far, right? So we're spending a lot of money and people are talking about beach nourishment as maybe the answer in California. But if we look to the East Coast, we can see that it's a, it's a big black hole for money and time and repetitive nourishment episodes. 
We've done some things in California using opportunities for beach replenishment. This is an emergency permit action in Santa Barbara using some of the uh, debris from the Montecito flows. And it, it actually um, built a little tiny groin here and built back the beach for a time and it's still there. Uh, so there are some uh, ways to think about maintaining beaches in the short run. That is, brings us to what people are calling living shorelines. And I know that Marin County is, is looking at a, a living shoreline project now for Stinson Beach and maybe um, other beach locations too. Uh, but ba basically that's the idea of, well, is there a way we can use nature to build a protection scheme in, front, in between the ocean and development? And so, you know, we spend a lot of time doing this kind of berm building, but we wouldn't call that a living shoreline as opposed to like putting a berm, in, uh, a restored dune in front of the homes to protect them. And so in some cases <clears throat> we've taken uh, existing revetments and we've buried them in sand with coupled with sand replenishment and then restored them to look like dunes. The real question with these projects is how long are they gonna last? Right, because they are going into a place where maybe they, uh, it's artificial given the dynamics of the ocean and the, and the geomorphology. This is an example from Broad Beach where the homeowners came together to form a district to charge themselves money to deal with this emergency situation. And their proposal is to build the dune system on top of the revetment and replenish the beach for not just themselves, but for the public. Uh, but if you're following that one at all, you know it's still not done. Uh, we approved the permit for that in 20, um, 2014. This revetment went in in 2010. So it's already a decade old and we haven't done anything for this beach. That brings me to accommodation, which generally speaking is about the idea of rising above uh, and staying above the water level. This is Malibu. Uh, this is a house in Stinson Beach, which has been elevated to respond to the projected flood levels. One of the problems with um, elevation is that it allows the shoreline to move inland, but that also allows the public trust values that are associated with that shoreline to move inland. So we have this looming question about what are we going to do when these developments, private developments, start to encroach on what is essentially public land. And so, you know, the up to the mean high tide is considered public. But as sea level rises, that line is going to move gradually inland. And on a shallow beach, like a 40 to 1 slope beach, one foot of sea level rise means that line is going to move 40 feet inland. And so it doesn't take much sea level rise before you've got 100 or 200 feet of regression of the public tide lands starting to impact or interact with these private lands. So we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean for our future vistas and how our beaches are gonna look and be experienced? The other related issue to this beach loss is the fact that it's really an environmental justice question. If you think about who's benefiting from being able to stay along the coast versus who's not gonna be able to use the coast at all because we don't have any beaches to speak of. These were kids that came to um, Broad Beach when I was there one day, came up, looked down the stairs, saw that there was nothing but water and they left. Right, so that raises a fundamental question for what we have been doing. This is Del Mar moving now to managed retreat or planned retreat. This has been essentially a non-starter so far in California with lots of political opposition to the idea. Del Mar has said, no, we're not gonna do planned retreat. Pacifica, the same story. This is a sign that was um, seen around town when they were doing their adaptation plan. And one of the challenges we have in California is our real estate is some of the most expensive in the world. So it's understandable that people don't want to move, right? This is uh, three bungalows in 1972 in Santa Cruz County. This is what they look like today. The one in the middle is worth about $8 million, according to Zillow. So if you look at our home values in California, this is statewide numbers gradually going up almost to 590,000 by 2020. But when you put in the coastal uh, locations, here's the statewide number here. This is Stinson Beach, right? You can see that these properties are huge, a huge value. Uh, and so that puts a, a premium on being able to do something with them or not. These are the um, apartment buildings I showed earlier and they were renting at about $3,000 a month, depending on how big they were. 
we have done a lot, quite a lot of um, buyout programs nationally through FEMA. These are all of the locations where properties have bought, been bought out, mostly along uh, river floodplains and things. Um, so it can be done, but the problem is the amount of money it would take. And so this is an example where Oakwood Beach in Staten Island has been gradually uh, retired with $120 million. At this point, they had bought 300 properties successfully to remove them from this former wetland. Uh, that wouldn't go very far. This is another example from New Jersey. But when you look at Broad Beach, <clears throat> $120 million would get you about 12 houses, given the average $10 million price for a house on Broad Beach. So in the last uh, couple minutes here, I just want to go over some of the things that we have done pretty well. Um, we've routinely required setbacks for new development. And in the last couple of decades, we've done what I would call a rolling easement by asking homeowners to assume the risk of these developments, uh, agree to never build a seawall, and also require the removal of these developments if and when that becomes necessary. We've also done a good job with the regulatory program and enforcement. So for, in this case, for example, the Half Moon Bay Ritz put in a revetment to protect their 18th green. The Coastal Commission said, you know what, that's not really a, consistent with the Coastal Act, take it out and see how the beach responded. One of my favorite examples of a planned retreat was when we worked with uh, Caltrans to relocate this section of Highway 1 in San Luis Obispo County. This was again an emergency permit, uh, but when they did it, which we allowed because it's an important resource to protect, we said, why don't you start planning to move the highway inland? And they said, okay, that'll take us 15 years. And we said, great, let's get started. And so over time, they did this uh, sequence of three permits with us to make sure that the planning did happen and they did relocate the highway. It's since been opened and you can see the old alignment is gonna become, I guess I'm done, uh, is gonna become a new segment of the coastal trail. So it took a lot of effort, it took a lot of time, it took 15 years to get it done, but we systematically planned the relocation of this piece of infrastructure. The irony for me is last time I was there, the elephant seals have already been moving in on the shoreline. So it wasn't necessarily for people that we did this, but maybe another species. We also successfully uh, worked with the city of Morro Bay when they wanted to um, upgrade their wastewater treatment plant in this vulnerable location. We said, nah, that's not a good idea. Why don't you look at an alternative? They have since started construction on this inland location out, out of the hazard zone. <clears throat> a really good example of a uh, successful retreat in a case, <clears throat> the army uh, had tried to protect this structure for many years by throwing rock down on the beach. Uh, when they demolished the structure, we asked the army to please take the rock when you go. And they said, yes, sir and they did it and the beach has restored itself nicely because this particular place is just a former dune system and it quickly equilibrated with the ocean. And then one of my also favorite examples of um, working with development is in Monterey, something called the window on the bay. And here, this wasn't a planned retreat project, but early in the 70s and 80s, the city of Monterey said, you know what, we wanna make this area a public shoreline park and they systematically targeted properties for sale. They never used eminent domain. They always worked with willing sellers. And this is what it looks like today. So you can do it. You just have to put your mind to it and allocate the funds over time. Um, <clears throat> the irony here is they now need this space for flooding. So bringing it back to the, um, the sunken cathedral, uh, which is another view of it here, it started to fall onto the beach and become a hazard. And so the city of Half Moon Bay said, you need to remove that under your original permit, you're required to remove this piece of development. And they did. So that has started to come out. Now there's an interesting question about what will the hotel do when it starts to fall in? Because the same permit condition applies to the hotel. That'll be a much bigger battle, I'm sure. The, but one of the last things I wanna just say is that, um, you know, there's been a lot of opportunity position to and, con and conflict around the idea of relocation, but it's really important to think about this as a process that's going to take place over time and across different pathways. And so lots of local governments, including Marin County, have started to talk about the pathway approach, which is 
okay, there's change happening at a certain point, we're gonna to need to make a decision about how we wanna handle it, depending on how we go, then there might be another decision, it might be beach nourishment, it might be seawalls, it might be managed retreat. So you're making these decisions along pathways over time. And this is the Marin County example for Stinson Beach where they've got the next hundred years mapped out and possible costs with different strategies to incrementally adapt to what's gonna inevitably happen out there. So again, engagement is key. What EAC is doing and having people involved in the process to let the decision makers know what you think about these things. And so I'm gonna just conclude with uh, a summation of what I see as this coastal clash in our future. Uh, those of you who grew up with the clash, the question is, should I stay or should I go now? If I go, there will be trouble. And if I stay, it will be double. And I think the, deck, the technical data bears that out when you look at how much money we spend on mitigation and the bang for the buck you get out of that by doing it ahead of time. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Sorry, I went over. No, great presentation, really informative, really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna transition now over to um, our next presenters. So I have the honor of welcoming two speakers. Um, who are going to further expand on some of these concepts, Drs. Patrick Barnard and um, Dr. Kevin Bethis. Ashley and I met Patrick and Kevin over the summer after we, um, sorry, I just got a note on here, after we learned about their research. And the research is particularly interesting for some of the coastal areas of West Marin, and we thought our community would love to meet them and learn a little bit about their work. Dr. Patrick Barnard has been a research geologist uh, with uh, United States Geological Services, Pacific Coast Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz since 2003. He was the research director for the Coastal Climate Impacts Program and co-developer of the Coastal Storm Modeling System, COSMOS. His research focuses on the coastal hazards driven by storms and climate change along U.S. beaches and estuaries. His research has been published in over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers, and he serves on numerous regional and national international scientific review panels related to climate change, coastal hazards, and including the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and has advised members of the U.S. Congress and Cabinet, as well as state and local government representatives. Dr. Kevin Beffis is, or Beffis is an assistant professor at the Department of Geosciences, the University of Arkansas. Dr. Beffis, Beffis has been, began his faculty career in the Department of Civil and Archaeological Engineering at the University of Wyoming. Prior to moving west, he was a Mendenhall postdoctoral fellow at the U.S. Geological Woods Hole Survey Coastal Marine Science Center. His academic path led to the position started at Wheaton College, followed by a master's in geological science at the University of Colorado, and a PhD in geological sciences at the University of Texas. He studies a wide range of hydrological problems focused on how groundwater systems interact with changes near the land surface, ranging from the coast and mountainous continental interiors, extending as far back as the last glacial maximum. So today, they will teach us a little bit about how the United States Geological Survey's Cosmos groundwater team used numerical models to forecast how coastal water tables may rise with higher sea levels to understand the potential for sea level rise to cause groundwater flooding and shoaling along California's coastline. Hey, thank you for the introduction. So. Patrick and I are going to tag team this and he is going to lead us off. Thanks and thanks Ashley and Morgan for pulling this together and Charles, great intro and sort of segue to what we're gonna talk about, which is kind of some of the science that supports some of these, some of these policy and management considerations. So, you know, climate change is a local issue very much so, but there has this broad sort of, you know, international, national, international and global implications. You can just click through Kevin, I guess, and it'll maybe make it easier. But, you know, currently there, we're moving toward having 1 billion people living in the coastal zone. And it's not just sort of these faraway exotic places like the Maldives. You know, there's lots of low line areas across the United States also. Um, but if we look at just the median projection, so the, sort of the, what the, we have the largest amount of, um, of agreement on terms of future projections, um, sea level will cause the once in a lifetime coastal flooding event to occur about every year by mid-century and about every day by 2100. So you're looking at these extreme events, those water levels at the beginning of the same water levels we see on a daily basis by the 
end of the century. So that's something to kind of think about as we look at some of these hazards issues. Um, but the, the coast is not static, it's dynamic, it evolves and and the ocean water level is not static, it is dynamic, it, it evolves with storms as well. And so when we consider storms and coastal change, there's about three times more people at risk of flooding and other coastal hazards than if we just consider the coast and the water level to be static moving forward. Now we've looked at this across California, what that equates to is a, over half a million people at risk and about $200 billion in property um, by end of century. And that's about um, 6% of the GDP. So even though we have a very sort of active tectonic margin setting, um, millions and millions of people are built on the lowest line portions of the state, like across San Francisco Bay, like Marin. Most of the people, most of the transportation corridors are very low elevation. So this presents a major challenge. And and we look at these hazards, you know, across um, across California, you know, by end of century, these are going to, you know, equate to some of our largest natural disasters in the historical record, and in fact, um, quite a significant amount greater um, when compare these to wildfires. Um, the hazards associated with sea level rise and storms are going to be about ten times greater um, than what than the most recent wildfires and earthquakes, for example. Um, so you can click through to the next slide, please. And so when we approach the coast in this non-static dynamic um, format, because while these so-called bathtub models um, are really effective at looking at the daily impacts of sea level rise, so we're basically just looking at what gets flooded if we raise sea level and we look at the high tides, that's a really nice way to look at the average um, sort of daily impacts of sea level rise. but. Um, and this is an example showing the Stinson Beach area with just half a meter of sea level rise, something we might see by the end of century. But if you then add even just an average annual winter storm to the picture, this is what the flooding might look like there at the base of sea drift. And so we built the coastal storm modeling system to incorporate these dynamic water level effects. You can click through, I think, one more time. Um, to bring in all the physics that affect water levels along the coast. So not just the sea level rise and the tides, but also seasonal effects like during El Nino when the water is warmer, um, it expands, we have higher seasonal water levels. And then the wind and low pressure during significant storm events can bring storm surge of a, on the order of about three feet in California. And then if you're close to rivers that can raise water levels um, and then waves break they raise water levels along the coast and then the land moves up and down. You have to incorporate all these different factors to really assess the risk of a community um, to the future sea level rise and storms. Uh, next slide, please. So we built this model across California called the Coastal Storm Modeling System. And the basic idea is that we take the future um, projections of the global climate um, take the wind fields, develop global wave models, and keep scaling those down to the local level, bringing all the other relevant factors, um, such as um, locally generated seas, tides, um, storm surge, rivers, et cetera, till we get to this sort of hyper-local planning scale. We can then move waves across the surf zone and project the flooding onto some web-based visualization tools and I'm gonna talk about just two of those real quick and then turn it back over to Kevin. So the, the data can be um, worked with at the planning scale. Um, next slide, please. And so this is just one particular interface, our Coast, our future tool, which you may have seen, which serves up all these flooding scenarios for California. Um, and really the, the, it's a nice sort of interactive tool where you can go in, you pick whatever sea level rise scenario you want, whatever storm scenario you want, you can turn on and off different layers of infrastructure um, and natural habitats, for example, and then click through scenarios. And here's just an example at the end of sea drift, looking at what sea level might look like um, with just high tide and then what, what it's gonna look like um, with an extreme storm. And so that's the kind of the value we tried to bring with Cosmos is looking at not just the, the daily impacts, but also the extreme impacts you can um, plan accordingly. Uh, next slide, please. More time. 
there it goes. You can click through uh, on this slide too. So the next step really is is translating this into socioeconomic impacts. And so what does this really mean? You know, these 2D flood maps are, you know, somewhat can be sort of esoteric in terms of not really providing the value that you need to understand and wrap your head around this particular issue. So we have this other tool called um, HERA, Hazards Exposure Reporting Analytics Tool, which translates these flood maps into something policy people can wrap their heads around. And so this is how we've made this relationship between what's flooded and what's in the flood zone itself. And so for, for California, this translates, you know, into, uh, you know, over half a million people at risk and then property and, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles of roads and critical facilities, et cetera. So kind of make, puts a little more of a context of what the, the true impact is. Uh, next slide, please, which I think is the last one. And however, in all this overland flooding work, what we have omitted though is the impact and hazards from below, that is a rising water table. And so we have, this has been noted in, in Miami um, where they're having these daily impacts where the water is coming up through the ground um, and flooding communities, but we have sunny day flooding here too in Marin um, during King High Tides, there's transportation corridors that have these kinds of issues, this sunny day flooding some of it related to groundwater, some of it related to overland flooding, but clearly it's something that we're missing and we wanted to include. Uh, I think there's one more click through and that's it. And so we have all these low lying areas that are susceptible to overland flooding, but there's also this groundwater hazard as well. And so we teamed up with Kevin to bring this science um, to California and to identify areas that are vulnerable also to this um, groundwater hazard, which Kevin is gonna talk about now. All right, thank you, Patrick. So I am going to start off with just, again, connecting on what sea levels might look like for the Marin Coast. And so this is a nearby prediction from the Ocean Protection Council and showing exactly what Charles was showing before, just not going quite as far into the future. And so the main levels that I want you to be looking at is in this 2100 region, we have a lot of uncertainty going from about one foot of sea level rise all the way up to 10 feet. And I'll be presenting this in meters. I'll be showing you a lot of these 2D esoteric maps that Patrick was just talking about. But something I wanted to have a poll question about before we really jumped into this groundwater piece was when you think of sea level rise, what aspects are the most concerning to you? Because a lot of this work is going to be uh, related to what, what people value. What do we want to protect? And so what are the actual physical processes that are going to be most of concern for you and your community? We've got about 20% voting. So take the poll that's popped up on your screen. When it gets to about 80%, I'll um, stop the poll and share the results. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll be receiving the results when everyone else does, so I don't get to sneak preview. So, and Patrick, I think I'm going to mute you because I've got some feedback on your side. There we go. Okay. And Kevin, just let me know if Patrick needs to be um, unmuted. There was no. We can keep him there. muted for the rest of the time. He's. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've had his. Yeah. No, he doesn't have any more slides. Maybe at the end when there are questions, he could be unmuted. Okay. All right. We've got about 86% in. So All right. Great. Let's let's see sure. what aspects are the most concerning. There are a lot of concerning things. There are actually some positive sides that we, we may get to touch on a little bit with the groundwater piece. So unsurprisingly, if you're seeing the same pop-up window that I'm seeing, that the majority of people are worried about surface flooding. And so that's good. We I know you could... Uh, click a bunch of different options. And something that I'm excited to see is that a lot of you have groundwater rise as a concern. And so I'm gonna be presenting some on what these groundwater concerns can be and um, maybe how they tie into some of these other pieces, both as a cause of groundwater rise, but also as a, a connection to that liquefaction and contamination piece as well. All right, so now that I have the laser on, I can still move forward. That's great. My slide just went blank, but all right. So the process of how groundwater flooding occurs, do you see something blinking on or off? It might just be my monitors turning on and off. Hopefully you can still see we what's can going see on. Your Excellent, good. Okay. All right, I'll just, if it goes too blank, I'll just 
Yeah, I think I nudged my computer desk a little bit too hard. So what's happening is that there's in the subsurface underground, there is fresh groundwater that's floating on top of salty groundwater in coastal areas. In some places in the continental interior, maybe it's not as salty, but in your coastal areas, there's fresh groundwater floating on salty groundwater. And this is in the shallowest aquifer. This is in the unconfined aquifer. There are deeper aquifers that have barriers uh, between them. And so if there's a clay unit or a really hard rock, there's a way to sort of disconnect that water, that aquifer from what's going on ab above it. And those are gonna be less sensitive to sea level rise. And so what I'm really focused on here is trying to understand how that shallowest aquifer, the unconfined aquifer, how its water table, so the place where you go from there being a little bit of air in the pores in between sediment or in the rocks to only having water at that interface, that's called the water table. And so we wanna understand how the water table could move up with sea level rise. And as that water table moves up, we call that groundwater shoaling. And if that water table hits the land surface, we call that groundwater emergence. And so groundwater is emerging from the subsurface and is becoming a flooding problem potentially. And so there are many hazards that are associated with this groundwater flooding. We're learning more and more about them. This is a new area of research. And so before I get into it too much, I wanted to ask you my second and last poll question of what are the coastal features that are most valuable to you? And I will try to um, pull on those to get a sense of what I should focus in on a little bit more here. But again, right, we wanna put our effort where our values lie. And maybe after this talk, your values may change a little bit, but maybe those values can also fit within the surface water flooding versus groundwater flooding uh, story as well. I've got about 40%, so Excellent. select all that apply and results are good. <coughs> And these are, these are for you, for your community, right? It could be for your house specifically, for your city, for your town, for your farm, for your favorite park. And so it, it's, right, values are, are a flexible thing and it can be all encompassing as well. All right, we've got 88% in. Perfect, let's see. Poll and share it. Uh, hold on, pop them to another monitor. All right, there we go. All right, it looks like we have a lot of nature lovers in the audience, but there's also the, the question of economics, right? The importance of different types of infrastructure. That there's infrastructure at the surface, but there's also buried infrastructure in these coastal environments. And so um, knowing how a rising water table is going to interface with these features and could lead to their um, you know, earlier destruction than just with the surface water flooding is something of concern. And so this is a graphic that was developed as part of a news article that came out with our with a paper that Patrick and I published back in August. And this only has a couple of the items that are of most concern with groundwater flooding, where if we have a water table, it's in this light blue, it kind of fades a little bit. But when we talk about groundwater flooding due to sea level rise, we're talking about these places where there might be ponding. And this ponding isn't connected to water that's running off on the surface. It's actually coming up from below. And it can happen at places even with relatively steep slopes. And so that's the sort of groundwater flooding story with this water table rise. But there are other things that happen as well. And so if we have storm sewers, any sort of buried pipes, buried infrastructure, if they were designed to go in somewhere that was originally dry and then becomes wet, and that's something where corrosion could become more, more active. There's also salty groundwater down here, and that does eventually move in. And so if we're thinking about corrosion, that can actually make things worse. There's been some work, not much work, done on how a rising water table can affect shallow foundations. Actually, um, it's something that happens in the Midwest a lot. Anywhere with shallow water tables, you have the potential for basements to flood, but you can also uh, affect the foundations and so you can be changing the hydrostatic pressure in the subsurface. That's exactly what's happening when the water table is rising. You're increasing the hydrostatic pressure. And you can also lead to more fatigue in roadways. And so roads actually don't last as long. And so if we're thinking of Highway 1, hopefully they've planned for relatively wet conditions. The last feature is that with a higher water table, there's just more water around. And so if there is a flood, a storm that comes through, some of these shallow waterways are gonna have more water in them with sea level rise just because the water table is shallower. And so that means that those canals or those streams are more likely to flood with sea level rise just because there's a water table there. And so there's this surface flooding problem that gets tied in with the groundwater flooding as well. 
So um, here's another graphic that I just wanted to share with you. It's uh, from an article in Bay Nature from a few years ago uh, that Christina Hill's group produced. And it goes into a lot of detail about many of these different ways that groundwater emergence, groundwater shoaling in coastal areas can affect our infrastructure. And so what I mainly want to focus on here is that I'm going to be showing you these maps, sort of like what Patrick showed you, where there's colors over a landscape, where you're looking at a map and there's colors on it. And so I'm going to be showing you these maps with this color scheme. And so in the blue areas, this is where I have marine and tidal water. And so that's where the land has been inundated by sea level rise. And so this is just open water is what the blues are going to mean. It's going to fit with the map color, so that won't be very visible. Are very obvious. In red is where there's emergent groundwater, and so that's where the water table is at the land surface. And the difference between that and the orange is that emergent means that groundwater is probably actively leaving the ground, and so there's some flow coming out. In the orange, it's where a water table is very, very shallow. Zero to one meters, basically it's soggy all the way up to the land surface, but there may not be active flow coming out of it. But orange and red are places where the water table is very, very close. And so this is where our flooding concerns mainly are. And in these areas also, if we're looking at this tree here, it might be a place where trees aren't getting enough oxygen to the roots. And so you get these things called ghost forests as trees are dying because the water table is too close to the surface. And so that's one of the uh, precursors of a way to tell that sea level rise is moving the water table up in your area is that you might have trees dying, you know, 100 meters inland and, um, even though the surface isn't flooding, you have that flooding from below that's starting to change the ecosystem. It can be a good thing if you want a wetland to migrate there. And so you're starting to maybe reduce the forest, but open up new parts of land to a wetland. I won't get into too much of that, but it is one of my research agendas. Um, in the yellow is shallow groundwater. That's where uh, some of our buried infrastructure will be. And so this is where some of our uh, storm sewers, septic systems, our buried pipes, buried wires are going to be located. But also in this purple, we're starting to get deeper water tables, right? Six to 15 feet deep. It's relatively deep, but that's where septic systems are also going to be generally buried. If you have a basement or uh, if you live in a big city with buried um, or uh, parking garages underground, this is where you're going to have to start installing pumps to make sure that that water table doesn't start flooding the lower levels there. And then I actually don't, anywhere where there's deeper groundwater, I just don't even show you because I don't want to distract you from that. And so the short of it is that I did this huge modeling exercise, physical simulations based on physics of how the water table will respond to sea level rise. And so really it's a hydraulics problem, but I did it for the whole coast of California. And I wanted to do it at very, very high resolution to really ask the question, how does the land surface elevation affect that ability of the water table to move up and down with sea level rise. Well, mainly up because we're only looking at sea level rising. And so I broke the coast up into a bunch of little segments so that I could say that the water table, I guess it's under the assumption that the water table in Marin is not very affected by the water table down in Los Angeles. And so we can say that they're separate, they're not feeling the same hydrology. And so we could break them apart and do it at super high resolution. So I used a grid cell. So I have one measurement or one prediction of what the water table will be for every 30 foot by 30 foot plot of land for the whole coast of California. Uh, going a, about a kilometer inland, sometimes a little bit farther. And so this represented about, I did maybe 4,500 models that I then produced into these data sets that were continuous for the coast of California. So this was a paper that came out back in August. And so now here is that map of colors that I was promising. And so if you wanna orient yourself here, we have the emergent groundwater in red, the basically emergent groundwater in orange, and then going to deeper and deeper waters. You'll see up here that we have a number that's increasing. So this is mean higher high water. And so that's a relatively high tidal datum. And what happens is that I run these models in a static sense. And so Patrick was saying the dynamic really lets us know more what's going on about flooding. But groundwater responds over long time periods. And so we can look at long-term averages. And so this is a long-term average based on a relatively high tide, just to see what that water table position would be doing. And so what we can see is that what's interesting, if you can catch it when it's showing just zero meters, 
And I guess as you look through the changes, there aren't that many changes in colors, right? The color patterns aren't actually moving too far inland. You see mostly that the blue starts taking over. So the inundation is actually doing a lot of the flooding. But for the most part, places where the water table is shallow today, stays shallow. And those shallow water tables don't move inland too much. Of course, we see one major um, outlier from that assumption. And so what's happening here is that the water table is actually able to move up because it's right. The peninsula is sort of like an island and it's relatively permeable materials. And so the water table is able to rise um, relatively uh, directly with sea level rise. And we can compare these are numerical modeling results. There is also a data set that Patrick's group uh, published that used observations from wells in the area. And we can compare those two for uh, present day scenarios as well as higher sea levels and they go together really well i'm not going to go into too many details here but i'm just going to throw them out here so you can see them we can we can talk about it more in detail later but one of the things is that with one meter of sea level rise we're starting to see that places with um right in the purple i had said that they're this would still affect septic system drainage and so it doesn't mean that septic systems won't work it just means that they won't be as efficient. You'll have to either pump them out more or you'll get uh, backups and have a smelly house, unfortunately. And so with two meters of sea level rise, right, this is hopefully beyond the 2100 sort of time scale, but you can see that the inundation starts uh, really raising those water tables as well. I also wanted to show you some cross sections of what's going on. So we're just not in that um, colorful map sort of scenario. And so we have three cross sections going up through here. And what I'm showing are three different water tables. There's a lot of uncertainty based on the geology. And we don't know the subsurface geology in 3D um, to the point where we can model them perfectly. And so what these are showing are different permeabilities. Permeability is how easy it is for water to flow through the ground. And in green is the least permeable. It's like having a clay or a silt. And what that does is it makes the water mound up. It's not able to flow easily to the coast. And so it piles up and it makes a really steep water table that's actually higher. And then in red is like water flowing through a gravel. It's relatively easy to do that. So it doesn't mound up. And so it ends up being a flatter water table. The thing about the red water table prediction here is that it's more responsive to sea level rise just because it's so well drained, it's able to, it, it, there's more space for it to move up. All right, and so I also wanted to show you Tamales Bay, just kind of a, a even more zoomed out sort of perspective. And again, what's interesting here is that places with shallow water tables today continue to have shallow water tables unless they get flooded or inundated by raising, rising sea level. You see a little bit of places where you can see some migration of shallow water tables moving in, but for the most part, it looks like that at least in these parts of uh, Marin County and um, the, for about 30 percent, I guess, no, so 70 percent of the coast of California responds in this way where the topography is limiting how much that water table can actually move up with sea level rise. And so places with shallow water tables today generally get inundated or stay about where they are. And the water table do doesn't rise the same amount as sea level rise. And so I also just show you a quick um, cross-section view of this. And what's interesting here is that we're raising water tables here. I didn't make it a pretty um, number, but it's zero point something in meters. And it goes from zero to five meters of sea level rise. And so this boundary, right? And so in the, in the bay itself, the water levels are raising by 15, 15 feet, five meters. And if we look at what the water table is doing in towards the inland portion, it's not rising by the same amount. It's pretty close for the high hydraulic conductivity, right? It's almost five meters. But if we look at the other permeabilities, the lower permeabilities, it dampens. And so just assuming that this water table can rise the same amount as sea level rise is generally gonna be um, kind of a worst case scenario. For the most part, what happens, and we can see that really nicely in some of these in the low permeability in the green water tables is that it's pinned by these low topographies. You can see it's right at the surface. And so the water flows out here, but then the water table actually gets gentler in its slope. And that's actually happening here as well. It's just 
happening inside of the screen a little bit farther. So there are 3D effects that are uh, limiting the ability of the water table to rise. We can look at how similar the water table rise is to sea level rise. And so here in red, in these very bright reds for San Francisco Bay, you can see that we have a little bit of our focus area here in this map as well. But the red is showing where the water table doesn't rise at all with one meter of sea level rise. And we can see that that dominates most of the inland areas. And then it goes to orange. And so it's still not rising very much. In the black are areas where the water table is basically rising the same as sea level rise. And so these are our places that are the most responsive that are going to change the most where groundwater flooding uh, is likely, it could be not happening now, but it will happen in the future. And so the areas in black are the places that are most sensitive to this groundwater emergence, groundwater shoaling problem. So again, these are steady state solutions, equilibrium long-term average but we have some ongoing work to, this is a slide built just off of Patrick's slide, looking at the dynamics. And so he didn't show what was going on with the water tables with all these dynamics. He was interested in this flooding from the surface, but it's connected through the subsurface. And so I have a project right now trying to understand what the magnitude is of these various forcings from the ocean with storms and tides and waves and how far inland that goes, what that does to the, the flooding hazard. And then tying it into Charles's presentation is we wanna know what to do about it. We don't wanna just say, well, this is what could happen, but we wanna know if we build a seawall or if we develop a natural shoreline or do a beach nourishment project, how will that affect both the surface water flooding and the groundwater flooding? And so we can make predictions of if we, try this adaptation strategy, can we go ahead and are we going to save ourselves from, are we gonna protect this portion of the coast from sea level rise from both that surface water flooding part and we're not gonna have groundwater flooding behind it because if we make this barrier and it keeps us from flooding from the coast but we end up flooding in this area anyway because the groundwater can't get out, then we're not, it's not serving its full purpose. And so with that, I just wanna leave you with a few resources. So our paper that came out in August that I was mentioning, we published all of these data. If you're really interested in downloading the thousands of files that we created, that's uh, in parts two and three. If you really wanna get into how I did it, you can go ahead and download all of my programming codes uh, that I used to make it. And we are currently working uh, to get these data into our Coast Star Future and the HERA um, web mapper tools. So you can actually zoom around and load these files up without having to install all this software. And so uh, these are in the works in the next, um, you know, maybe early 2021 sometime, we hope to have those available for everyone. And with that, I'd be happy to field questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin and Patrick, for that presentation. So we're now um, at the question and answer phase. Let me um, I'll stop sharing. figure out my three screen problem here that I got. <laughs> I'm going to just, I guess, spotlight myself. There we go. And I'm going to spotlight Ashley on here. And I need to find Charles him up and unmute okay and I'm gonna have you guys all unmute um, and we're gonna start the questions so for participants how we are hoping this will work is um, raise your hand in the participants menu I think under the more option you can select how to raise your hand and then what I can do is ask you to unmute and you can ask your question live if you want to. So let's see, anybody wanna ask a live question? It looks like no live questions so far. All right, well then Ash, do you want to read off some of the questions that would have popped up into the chat? Yeah, I can jump into those, Morgan. Um, so we have some questions first for um, Dr. Lester. And the first one was from David Rempel. And please forgive me, anyone, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. But um, he said, the interventions you presented seem small scale. 
The Netherlands has the most experience with ocean dikes, but these are huge projects put in place over hundreds of years. Could that approach work in California? Well, um, I think that's a good point about the scale of interventions, um, which is why I threw up the science fiction slide of the huge seawall going through LA. Um, you know, the, I, right now, I think in terms of scale, the kind of interventions in California are not necessarily seawalls, although if you look at a seawall like the, um, the what's known as the Shaughnessy seawall in San Francisco, which is quite long and it's quite large and um, going on 100 years of life. So it's been pretty um, stable in terms of its ability to maintain itself in that condition. Um, we do have some large seawalls, but it's really the sand replenishment that has been larger scale. So uh, not nearly, as I said, like what's happening on the East Coast, but these large uh, inputs of sand uh, are larger scale interventions, meaning beyond parcel scale beyond even individual cities, but almost sub-regional. That uh, San Diego County project was of a, you know, half of the county scale in terms of its effect. So <clears throat> I think it, um, you know, it's, it's an option in certain places. I know some people have talked about these larger, maybe a, a Netherlands type of intervention on San Francisco Bay, perhaps, um, but those, uh, types of solutions are not really being talked about extensively uh, in California, par partially because I think, um, you know, we have enough conflict and concern about the small scale interventions to say nothing of a huge project that would close off a bay or, or you know, attempt, attempt to deal with, um, like they're talking about in New York Harbor, um, you know, closing off the forces of the ocean or um, I just saw an article about the uh, elevating the dike in, uh, in Venice, Italy, which comes up, you know, at, it can be called up at, uh, when needed based on filling with air, you know. So I, I think there's probably a lot of creativity out there still to be thought about, but, um, you know, our our policy and regulatory system does not readily allow for such large scale interventions. Um, I've, I recently did a piece with um, Gary Griggs and some others about perhaps the need to reconsider or relook at the notion of using groins, which are, I didn't talk about that today, but these um, you know, structures, hard structures perpendicular to the coastline as a way to retain sand. Uh, and even that gets a lot of pushback um, because they are artificial interventions with the natural coastal processes and they do have their environmental impacts. Uh, so, you know, I think we need to start small if we're going to be considering hard interventions. Uh, and even uh, it was implied the some of the uh, living shoreline interventions that I talked about um, you know, I'm a bit of a skeptic on that because I really do think, uh, as Kevin said a couple of times, and I mentioned it's physics. And so each of these environments have physical parameters operating and you can't just assume that you could plop down a constructed dune in a particular place and it's gonna somehow save the shoreline from erosion because uh, physically it, it may just not work. So. Um, I think it's the nature of our coast and, and coupled with the social systems that aren't going to provide for those really huge interventions. Great, thank you. Uh, Ash, before you read the next question, I just want to put a note out there to folks that um, we're probably going to go over just by a few minutes. It is 1.30 right now. If you want to stay on for the Q&A, that would be great. Um, but we'll probably plan for about five to 10 minutes of questions if you want to hang around. Okay, go ahead, Ash, for that, the next question. And I still don't see any hands raised. So I think we'll just, um, if people want to enter them in the chat, we can answer them from there. Okay, well, I see a related question. So I'm going to um, ask that one. So this is from Leslie. And she says, related to David's question about uh, piecemeal protection projects and managed retreat, are there plans being discussed on a statewide level for raising funds and massive public education for larger scale managed retreat? 
Um, not necessarily managed retreat, but um, we have seen a lot of progress made, I think, on the funding front. So first, just recognizing uh, that whatever you call it, we're talking about a lot of money. Uh, you know, to move a highway section a few miles is millions and millions of dollars. I think that uh, there's numbers in your adaptation plan for Marin that talks about how much it would cost to raise the a highway along Tamales Bay, for example, something like $40 million to do that segment. So you start adding these, these costs up and it's massive for the state. We did have um, a bond measure being contemplated uh, for this last sequence, but with COVID, uh, all of the massive funding options kind of were taken off the table in terms of uh, their viability right now. But we have seen more interest in or recognition that we're going to need to figure out how to pay for these things. Um, the uh, in terms of managed retreat, you know that one of the things I didn't touch on a lot is um, I I think it's really important to ask ourselves who who is benefiting who what are the costs and benefits and how are they being distributed and who's winning and losing in any of these solutions. So a lot of the managed retreat attention nationally and internationally has focused on really cases where communities are being maybe forcibly relocated, right? And so a, a justice question is being raised about, you know, how can we force communities to relocate themselves or um, a lot of uh, even just my, what's called migration, not relocation. So you're voluntarily having to relocate because you're wherever you are is going underwater increasingly or whatever. So climate refugees, um, a lot of attention on, well, what are the social justice impacts of trying to move people out of these hazard areas? In California, you know, a lot of our areas we're talking about are Del Mar and Stinson Beach and even Imperial Beach, places that are, they're not um, on the lower end of the scale of affluence, right? There's a lot of money involved and so, I don't think we're going to end up paying publicly to man to buy out all those properties and move them. I, I just don't see that being politically feasible, but we do have to ask, how are we going to pay for it? Uh, that example I gave in Broad Beach in Malibu, those were the homeowners themselves that formed what's called the Geological Hazard Abatement District, which is a governmental structure, which you can then assess yourselves at property tax to pay for whatever it is you are organizing for. In that case, they were saying, we're going to pay an assessment and pay for this beach replenishment project. So it wouldn't be public monies. It would be of sorts. It would be monies only from those homeowners. You know, that seems much more viable to me than asking the public to pay for some sort of protection scheme of a, a place like uh, Malibu or even to relocate residents. What I really think in the end is... Um, markets are really going to play a big role. And we've started to see that already as insurance, the insurance industry starts to respond to the new risks and hazards we're facing. So with the fires, it's been more dramatic uh, places, companies not being willing to insure certain places any longer, uh, especially with repetitive losses. But I think as soon as the property markets start to move, which they have on the East Coast, uh, then you'll start to see people move on their own based on their economic interests. Thank you. I think, um, Morgan, let's see if we have time. I think I'd like to jump to a question for Dr. Beefus. This is from P Peter. And he says, um, where can we see the maps of our own communities in the finest detail so we can see what will happen to our own houses? Yeah, that's great. So it will be on the Our Coast, Our Future web viewer. I think that will be the, the best place. Unfortunately, it's in the works right now. And so right now, I guess if you wanted to go back through this video and pause it on certain